Although I didn't realize it at the time, when I was five years old, I was probably clinically depressed. I say this because in retrospect, it seems pretty obvious to me that functioning five-year-olds shouldn't be spending most days feeling too sick to get out of bed, too demotivated to go into school, or quite often being dragged crying down the hallways of the school by my parents. At the time, I had just moved from Toronto, Canada to Spokane, Washington, and the move was actually not that difficult for me. The difficult part was this random fall morning when I first set foot into the halls of East Farms Elementary. And that day, stepping foot into school for the first time for me changed my life forever, just as it probably did all of yours as well. As students, we're expected to spend 180 days a year, six hours a day, memorizing facts and skills. And I actually think that's awesome. Students are creative and curious, and I had actually spent my summer up until that point building things out of boxes and uh, learning to use Microsoft Word for a meetup group I was arranging with my neighbors and the kids in the McDonald's down the street. The problem is that, as kids, we really have no choice what or when we're going to learn. We really quickly learn the phrase, will this be on the test, is the only question that matters. And if the answer is no, throw that information out of your mind, no matter how interesting it might be to you. And there is always a test. It's like air. It's all around us. If you're a student right now, think about it. What test are you studying for? It's been that way since you first set foot in school. After some numbers of years, uh, years of this, you do get some flexibility. You get to take some electives. Now, those of us who've been students know this is when you elect to take the classes that are going to get you into a good college. And you also elect to take some extracurriculars that will get you into a good college as well. Hopefully, at some point in all of this, you had a teacher who was really passionate about helping share their passion for, you know, for whatever it is and helping you learn something, despite being really overworked and underpaid. And if you were lucky enough to have one of those teachers, that may have become your major. Speaking of majors, for many of you, that brings us to today, where after two years of taking your required core classes, you finally get two years to take whatever you're interested in before you graduate, get a job, work for the rest of your life, retire, and then die. <laughs> so you can see why, for me, as someone who just spent five years like building cool things out of boxes, this was a little bit depressing. And it may have stayed that way if not for a random bit of luck. One day I was at the library with my parents, and I came across this book that had a picture of a slot machine on the front of it. Now, I was a few years older, but I didn't really know what a slot machine was at this point. But the premise of the book was that I could make it, and that looks pretty cool. So I convinced my parents to check out the book for me, um, which was a challenge because it was pretty far above my level at the time, and I set to work trying to make it. I'm proud to say that I, I think I made something that looked kind of like a slot machine. I think I did code something kind of like that. But the thing that really stood out for me was that this was the first time since I started school that I realized that I could learn something without having permission to learn it, and that I could do something without having to take a test to prove that I knew how to do it. That started a spark in my mind. It made me start to question, what would the world look like if we as students started learning for learning's own sake, rather than because someone told us we had to? That was a thought that came to dominate the rest of my life. Now, I know what you're saying. Tyler, you can't just throw a bunch of students in a room and say, learn, and expect that they're going to become productive members of society. And I agree with you, which is why I've spent most of my adult life trying to figure out a model that works. And I think I've done it. So I'm going to share with you three ways today that I think we can rethink education. So whether you're a current or future professor, or just someone who's one day going to be called upon to mentor someone as a, at a job, as everyone will be, I hope that some of these thoughts will help you rethink what it means to be an educator. The first thing I want to talk about is that education should embrace creativity. When I was in high school, some friends and I started what would become the Worldwide Nonprofit Code Day. And we wanted to do something interesting. We wanted to get students into this up and coming field of computer programming. And we were going to do this by getting students together for a weekend and having them build apps and games. But what was revolutionary was that rather than having them do it in a class format where we teach them step by step how to do things, we were just going to tell them, tell us what you want to make and we'll help you make it. We advertised our first event by putting some ads on Facebook that just had a picture of an Xbox 360 controller. And we said, do you have an idea for a game? Come join us. We'll help you make it. Much to our surprise, despite how sketchy this looks, we actually got 60 or 70 students who came to this really questionable looking like, office space that we had rented out in Industrial Bellevue. Some of them had driven for one to two hours. And most of them had no prior interest in coding whatsoever. They just had ideas for video games. The event started out a little awkward, but sure, slowly but surely, students did start coming up to the front of the room and telling us the ideas for what they were going to make. And these ideas were some of the most creative things I have ever heard. Like this game, Time Swap, a game where, yes, you're shooting things with a gun, but it's a time gun. 
And the things you shoot go forward in time. And then you, yourself, are going to go forward in time later. And so the more things you shoot, the more difficult the later levels become. Or this game, much later, uh, Thorns, a game where your words are your weapons, and you use them to build up your friends and take down your enemies. Both of these games, if it weren't obvious, were actually made at our events. And they also made the art as well, which is beautiful. And some of them even made soundtracks. By allowing students to be creative, we really inspired them to learn. Again, most of these students had no prior interest in coding, but they learned the code that they needed to make these amazing things in just a weekend because they were so driven by the ability to be creative. One of the things that came out of this that most inspired me to continue on this path was a student who at the time had dropped out of high school and was working at a Best Buy. And after going to a few of these events, got so excited about coding that they ended up getting a job in the tech industry and now are a senior software engineer. So that's the importance of creativity in education. The next thing I wanted to talk about is solving real world problems. And by the way, this is a cancer detection algorithm that some students worked on. So we know that students get caught up in this loop of study, test, study, test, study, test. Again, you're always studying for a test. But we also know that to function in the real world, you need to start to get the ability to work independently. I've been really lucky to do some work with a program out of Cal State University, Monterey Bay. And this program uh, works with students across the state, uh, mostly smaller local colleges, a lot of underrepresented students. Um, and we're trying to help them get jobs in the tech industry, to, to get th getting them the experience that they need to do that. We needed to help them break out of this loop and start to function a little bit more independently. And to help them break out of this cycle, we did that with open source software. Now, if you've never heard of open source software, here's the only thing I want you to remember about it. If you think of any app installed on your phone, you probably think it's made by a company like Apple or Microsoft. But large parts of it are actually written for free by unpaid volunteers on the internet because they think it's fun. Sounds crazy, but it's true. And anyone is welcome to contribute. And because anyone is welcome to contribute, we invited these students to contribute. Despite being initially terrified at the idea of making contributions to code that's in use by tens of thousands or even tens of millions of people, the students absolutely thrived in this assignment. They did things that they, that they learned things in four weeks that their professors never thought they'd be able to learn in four years of education. And they made real contributions that are now in use by software that you probably use at some point in your day. The thing that makes this work is agency. The ability to change the world around us. This is something that the school system typically ignores, but when you think of most social movements in the history of forever, they're often driven by young people because young people see the world around them and they want to change it. They see things they don't like and they come up with ideas for how to improve it. And when we show them how the knowledge that we're giving them can help them immediately make an impact on the world, it's a strong motivator for them to learn more. So that's creativity and doing real world work. The last thing I wanted to suggest is that education should be cross-disciplinary. Think back to when you were in middle school. It was probably a pretty miserable time, right? That's because for most of us, middle school is when we're developing our sense of identity. Who we are, what we like, and uh, what sort of people we want to hang out with, what people like us do. So let's say you graduated middle school and you're in high school now, and you are pretty sure that you're an artist or a musician. And then you get placed in this required computer science class, right? And by the way, this is what you think a computer programmer looks like. <laughs> There's just not a lot of chance that your teacher is going to be able to do much to convince you that this is something exciting to you, because it's not something that an artist would do. To help figure out how to get around this, I spent five years co-teaching a, a computer science class at Garfield High School. And the premise of the class took advantage of two of the things that I already talked about. It was creative, because at the beginning of the year, we asked students what they wanted to make, apps or games, and that was what they were going to work on for the year. It solved real world problems because we actually made the students do the research to show that some, their friends or their family, someone they know, would actually use it. But we added a third thing. It was cross-disciplinary. You could take this as a computer science class, but you could also take it as an art class and do the art for a video game. So we were able to bring together these people who would normally never be interested in computer science, but do it in a way that was authentic to their sense of who they were. And so we had artists who were working on art for video games, but then gradually they started to realize, well, I need to learn a little bit of code to get the art in the game. And we also had computer scientists learning a lot more about art along the way as well. By allowing students to authentically feel like they can still engage with their identity, but giving them a chance to explore a new field, we were able to convince many of these students that computer science was a lot more interesting than they thought. And indeed, many of the, the artists are actually still in some way using computer science. And many of the computer scientists are still using art as well to this day. So those are three ways that I think we can all reshape education. And 
I think that these are very practical, and, and in my experience, these are things that are very doable. But even if you don't believe me on any of that, or even if you don't think you could take these back to your own life, there's one thing I want you to take away from this talk. We as a society need to rethink what the purpose of education is. The world has become tremendously more productive in the last like 100 years especially, right? I mean, it's just astounding the things that we've been able to accomplish in the last 100 years. And I have no doubt that all of that is because of education. But education is not valuable because it's productive. And education is valuable because it's fun. And students don't care about productivity, they care about fun. So really, when I say, what would the world look like if students learn for learning's own sake, what sort of amazing discoveries would we have if we had embraced the power of students to be curious and creative and to learn things because they're interested in them? What sort of amazing discoveries would they have come up with in these last 100 years if not for the system that we've set up for them? So I want everyone to leave this talk thinking about this one question. What would the world look like if students learned for learning's own sake? Just as I have every day since I first set foot in the school in 1998. Thank you.